A young girl was kidnapped and held captive for years and years by an insane religious nut and his psychopath wife in a small compound in their backyard. Hey, yeah, uh, before we get started, I need to apologize that I'm probably going to be censoring some words in this video. YouTube is being, uh, YouTube, and they're kind of coming down hard on me for pretty much every video and refuse to monetize, like, everything. So, uh, if I do have to censor a word, I will put it up on screen. I kind of apologize to people who are just listening, but I'll try to make it clear what I'm talking about through context alone, so let's get going. Let's start by going back to the year 1990, when I was but a wee child. In September of that year, a young girl named J.C. Dugard and her family moved from Los Angeles to Myers, California, a city just south of Lake Tahoe. Her mother and stepfather were looking for a safer community in which to raise their children. J.C. was in the fifth grade, a really shy but kind kid. She was close to her mother, Terry Proben, and her half-sister, Shayna, who was born just that year. Her biological father wasn't in the picture, but she did have her stepfather, Carl Proben. One year after their move, on June 10th of 1991, J.C. Dugard, now 11 years old, got ready for school and was walking up her street towards the bus stop. Her mother had left for work early in the morning and her stepfather was still at home, working in the garage. J.C., dressed in all pink, walked up to the hill, against traffic, trying to catch her bus when a gray car approached her. She assumed the person inside was about to ask her for directions, so she stopped to see what they had to say. A man inside the car rolled down his window and suddenly shot her with a stun gun, knocking her out cold. It was then that a woman from inside the car grabbed JC, took her in, and they sped off together. Her stepfather Carl was able to see this from their home. However, his line of sight wasn't great. He hopped on a bicycle left in the yard and feverishly chased after them, but he wasn't able to catch up. A few of JC's classmates saw the whole thing, but they were unable to identify the kidnappers. The woman in the car held her down as she drifted in and out of consciousness all throughout their three hour drive going about 120 miles away. JC woke up from time to time and eventually spoke up only saying that there was no way her parents could possibly afford a ransom. The woman removed all of her clothes, leaving only a butterfly-shaped ring on her finger. The man then placed a blanket over her head and took her from the car to his property. They dragged her to a backyard full of sheds and storage units and placed her into one particularly small soundproof unit. They left her in the unit alone, completely naked, and bolted the door shut. They told her that attack dogs were outside if she attempted to leave. The man would then visit her from time to time, bringing food, milkshakes, and talking to her. Of course, the police were immediately notified of the kidnapping. They initially suspected Carl himself, or possibly even Ken Slayton, her biological father, of kidnapping her. However, Carl was able to pass the polygraph with flying colors, and the police eased up on him. When it came to her biological father, it was found out that he didn't even know he had a daughter. He had only had a short fling with the mother, and she never told him of the pregnancy. Both were cleared of their suspicion, leaving very little leads. All the police really had was a sketch of the woman who pulled JC into the car, which is honestly terrifying. Within only hours, national media was all over this case, and dozens and dozens of volunteers appeared to help aid in the search for JC. All available community resources were put to work and utilized in full. Tens of thousands of flyers and posters were distributed all throughout the United States. The town was decked out in pink ribbons, her favorite color, as a sign of support towards her and her family. Her mother, Terry, founded a group called JC's Hope, which worked to coordinate volunteering and fundraising efforts in order to raise funds for poster materials, postage, and even t-shirts, sweatshirts, and buttons to sell. A substantial award for information leading to her finding was offered and applied to the posters and flyers. A local band called Perfect Circle even composed a song in support of her. Lazy. 
On June the 14th, the case was featured on America's Most Wanted, giving the nation more details of her case. This continued for months and months, and eventually years and years, as the family held out hope that JC was alive. And unbeknownst to them, luckily or unluckily, she was. JC had been kidnapped by Philip and Nancy Garrido, a wickedly evil criminal couple in their 60s. Philip had a long history of kidnapping and abuse spanning decades. According to his father, he was in a motorcycle accident as a teen, after which he changed dramatically and turned to drug use, mainly meth and LSD. In 1972, Philip was charged with assaulting a 14-year-old girl. However, he got off when she refused to testify in court. Shortly after that, he married his first wife, who he often abused and tortured. When she tried to leave him, he kidnapped her and took her back home. In 1976, he kidnapped 25-year-old Catherine Calloway in South Lake Tahoe. He took her to a warehouse in Reno, Nevada, where he forced himself on her for five and a half hours straight. Police noticed his car parked in the warehouse lot and a broken lock on the door. Going in to investigate, they were greeted by Philip, when Calloway then called for help from behind him. He was arrested and charged for crimes in both state and federal courts. The court ordered a psychiatric evaluation, where he was labeled as a sexual deviant and chronic drug abuser, with the drug seen as being a particularly significant factor in his deviancy. In court, he even admitted to often parking outside of elementary and high schools and touching himself. He was convicted in 77, and soon began serving what was supposed to be a 50-year sentence. While in prison, he met a woman around his age named Nancy, who was visiting her uncle. By 1981, they were married while he was still incarcerated. He was released in 1988, 11 years served, and moved into the home of his elderly mother, where he was monitored with a GPS ankle bracelet and visited often by parole officers. Shortly after his release, he paid a visit to his previous victim to harass her. His parole officer was informed of this, but never followed up on it. Eventually, he started a life together with Nancy, and they got married. It is believed that Nancy scouted out JC as a gift for her husband. Shortly after arriving at his property, Philip forced JC to shower with him. She had never seen a naked man before in her life until now. A week later, he had his way with her for the first time, as she remained handcuffed. She wore these handcuffs for a week straight, with Philip being her only human interaction. She was then given a bucket as a toilet and a TV, but was forbidden to watch the news in case she were able to learn about the search for her. A month and a half later, she moved into a larger room next door, but remained handcuffed to a bed this time. Philip explained to JC that demon angels had allowed him to take her and that she was here to help him relieve frustration because society had abandoned him. He would go on benders, getting extremely high, when he would force JC to dress up and cut out figures from dirty magazines with him. He attempted to make her listen to the voices in his head with him. Philip gradually began to believe he was a prophet from God. His drug-fueled benders would end and he would suffer severe crashes in which he would alternate between sobbing and apologizing to threatening to sell JC to other people who would lock her up in a tiny cage. After several months of near complete isolation, he properly introduced JC to his wife, Nancy, who brought her a stuffed animal and some chocolate milk. Nancy even tearfully apologized to her for her kidnapping. JC came to kind of like her in a way and in some twisted fashion actually longed for her approval. However, Nancy was just as horrible as her husband. She would often unpredictably flip-flop between motherly love and absolute cruelty. She was jealous of JC, and she also blamed her for this entire predicament. During this time, the Garritos would continue to target other children as well. They would film children at schools and parks from their car, and even invite young girls into their van. In a video later released to the courts, Nancy was seen getting a young girl into their van and asking her to pose in provocative ways. 
The chilling videotape <laughs> released today is from the back seat of Nancy Garrido's van as she coaxes a young girl to demonstrate gymnastics. That's it. Can you go all the way down? Yes. Let me see. I bet you can go down really easy, huh? Yeah, but that is easy. Nancy would go on to do this as much as 20 times with various young girls during this time period. Throughout this time, parole officers would routinely come to the Garrido home. However, their inspections were so brief and rushed that they failed to detect JC just meters away, time after time after time. Philip was forced to temporarily return to prison after failing a drug test. Nancy became the new captor. JC described Nancy as an evil, twisted nursing home aide. JC was given two kittens who would each mysteriously vanish. She was also given a journal. However, she was forced to tear out pages in which she signed her real name. From that point on, she was never allowed to use her name again. Three years later, Philip had been released, and JC began to be allowed brief breaks from her handcuffs, although still kept in a bolted shut room. On Easter in 1994, she was given cooked food for the first time during her captivity. The reason was, unfortunately, because they believed her to be pregnant. Being nearly 14 years old and sealed away since she was 11, she only knew of pregnancy through what she had seen on her TV. At the time, sketches displaying what she may look like at 14 were being distributed throughout the country. While her mother worked to search for her, JC was put to work studying TV programs about pregnancy in preparation for her upcoming birth. Near this time, it has been said that JC visited a gas station with the Garritos at some point. A man noticed who he thought was JC intently staring at a missing poster of herself on the wall. Naturally, he called the police, telling them that he had just seen the girl leave in a yellow van. The police never pursued the matter, and it's still unknown if the girl was actually her. JC's first daughter was born in August of 1994. Her captivity would continue for years, leading to yet another pregnancy and the birth of her second daughter in 1997. She focused on learning how to be a mother from what she could scramble together from TV sitcoms and worked diligently to protect them from Philip and his continued prolonged rage. J.C. would go on to meet her young neighbor, Patrick, through a hole in the fence. He asked her name, and she told him. He continued to ask if she was living there now, or just visiting. She responded that, unfortunately, she lived there now. Philip quickly came out and rushed her back indoors. He built a much sturdier, eight-foot-tall fence after this. He set up a tent for J.C., making this the first time she was allowed outdoors since her kidnapping. She spent her time tending to a garden and homeschooling her daughters the best that she could. Eventually, Philip informed her that her daughters would have to start referring to Nancy as their mother, and JC was to tell them that she was only their older sister. These lies would especially continue as JC and the girls were slowly allowed to interact with outsiders. JC would help Philip with his print shop, working as a graphic artist. She was eventually trusted with both a business phone and an email account. Customers would say that she never gave any hint of her true identity or that she was in any sort of trouble. The fire department was called and informed of a child with a shoulder injury, supposedly from a swimming pool accident, at the Garrido's home in 2002. The information was not provided to Phillips' parole officers, despite there being no record of either juveniles or a swimming pool at his address. Predictably, for a crazy-ass individual such as Philip, he started what he called his God's Desire Church, in which he ranted about his crazy religious beliefs. He also claimed that he had learned to control sound with his mind, and even that he invented a device that would let other people experience the phenomena. In 2006, one of the Garrido's neighbors called the police to inform them that their neighbor, a psychopathic offender, had tents in his backyard in which multiple young girls were living. An officer came to the Garrido's home and simply told Philip that it would be a code violation if he had people living outside his property, and left. Then again in 2009, a parole agent visited the Garrido's home where he encountered a 12-year-old girl. The Garritos explained that she was simply their niece. 
However, a call to Garrido's brother confirmed that he didn't have any children. But despite this, it was never followed up on. By this time, JC was living in a separate backyard behind the Garrido home. It contained multiple storage sheds, with Philip now using the soundproof room as a place to record his own bizarre gospel music. Two homemade tents were on the lot, containing a camp-style shower and toilet. This area was surrounded by thick trees and a six-foot-tall fence. The car used in the abduction was left in this area as well. The electricity was supplied from extension cords from the main house. JC was now given enough free reign that she was able to answer the door when people came to the home. However, she was so broken by this point that she never attempted to leave. In August of 2009, Philip himself visited the San Francisco FBI office and left them a four-page essay detailing his wicked views on religion and sexuality. He claimed that he had come to a conclusion on how to prevent problem behavior such as his. The next day, he went to a police office at the University of California with JC's two daughters, asking permission to hold a special seminar on campus to explain his revelations. The events manager described him as erratic, and his daughters as sullen and submissive. She asked for his name so that she could get back to him the next day. He gladly complied. An officer quickly ran a background check on his name, discovering that he was a convicted sex offender on parole for charges of both kidnapping and rape. He returned for his appointment the next day, along with his two daughters. The girls were noted as being extremely pale, virtually never seeing sunlight, probably, and behaved very unnaturally. We asked her what grades they were in, fourth grade and ninth grade, and I think Lisa asked, do you guys go to school? And they, they both, just like, like robots, were homeschooled, just very straight. I was okay, and this, the one thing that, to point out that we noticed right away is the coloring of these two little girls. They were extremely pale. In comparison to, to Philip, they were extremely, extremely pale. Bright blue eyes, just like him. I mean, just penetratingly blue eyes. And just kind of, just, I just got a weird, uneasy feeling. His parole violations alone were grounds for arrest. Two parole agents rushed to the Garrido home later that day. Not finding the girls, they took Philip back to his parole office. He explained that they were merely the daughters of a relative. Although he wasn't allowed to associate with minors, he was allowed to go home. He was ordered to return to the office the next day to further discuss this all. He arrived at the office with his wife, and for some inexplicable reason, the two girls and JC herself. The parole officer separated them in order to better identify them and get their separate stories. JC told them that her name was Alyssa, and although Philip was a bad man in the past, he had changed, and he had become a great person who was good with the kids. The two girls' response was more or less the same. JC became visibly agitated when they pressed for more information about her identity. She said that she was a battered wife from Minnesota who was hiding from her husband. The interviewing officer knew that something was up, but couldn't immediately prove it. So he contacted Concord Police. Once a sergeant showed up, Philip flat out admitted that he had kidnapped and raped her. The woman known as Alyssa finally gave up the act and revealed her true identity as J.C. Dugard, the young woman who had been missing for 18 years. When questioned about why she lied about her identity, she said that complying with her captor and acting with compassion were simply the only ways she knew to survive. Philip and Nancy were swiftly placed under arrest, and JC was put on the phone with her mother. They were soon reunited, and for the first time in 20 years, her mother was able to see her and meet her granddaughters. JC returned home to her mother and stepfather. She and her daughters were confirmed to be in good health, all things considered, and fairly educated thanks to their internet access. They took the reunion slowly and gently, J.C. had unfortunately developed a bond with Philip, and her daughters cried upon learning of his arrest. J.C. received custody of her daughters officially, and she was allowed to reclaim the pets that she had on the Garrido property. The Garrido property, business, and even neighboring properties were searched inside and out. Philip was confirmed now to be a suspect in the kidnapping of Michaela Gerecht, who disappeared in 1988. 
Philip would say that this was actually a powerful, heartwarming story of a life-changing redemption. He said that the birth of the two daughters changed his life and finally allowed him to realize, quote, something that humans have not understood well, referring to the bullshit that he had handed over to the FBI prior. The documents were eventually released, called Origin of Schizophrenia Revealed, a paper consisting of methods to stop schizophrenics from turning violent by controlling sounds around them with your mind. The Garritos were charged with kidnapping and false imprisonment. They pled not guilty. Bail was almost sarcastically set for Nancy at $30 million. Philip wasn't allowed bail at all. Katie Calloway, the woman Philip had kidnapped previously, would appear at the hearings. She never spoke a word, only watching silently. After years of messy hearings, the Garritos made full confessions. Nancy had been facing 241 years in prison, and they decided they would do all they could to reduce the sentence. They began to describe Nancy as a victim manipulated by Philip, even labeling her as having Stockholm Syndrome. However, they changed their minds and pled not guilty again anyway. However, by 2011, they finally got their shit together and pled guilty to kidnap and rape by force. Philip was sentenced to 431 years to life in prison, while Nancy received 36 years to life. For some ungodly reason, they are eligible for parole in 2034. However, by then, they would be 83 and 79 years old. JC did not attend the sentencing, instead giving her mother a written letter to read aloud in court. JC was awarded a $20 million settlement due to various lapses in judgment by the authorities that could have led to her being saved many, many times throughout the years. It was found that Philip violated his parole or went unsupervised for long periods of time at least 59 times throughout those years. The district attorney called at least one of Philip's parole agents utterly incompetent in court. It was revealed that other girls had went missing within a 20-mile radius of the Garrido home while JC was being held captive. Although unsolved, the police sketches of the suspect are said to resemble Philip Garrido. His case has been used to make a point about the dangers of releasing high-risk prisoners too early, and about more diligently following parole protocols. JC would go on to write a book about her time in captivity called A Stolen Life, a Memoir. Shortly before the book was released, she gave her first lengthy interview on TV with Diane Sawyer. Various crime shows and documentaries would speak about the case over the coming years. JC would go on to write a second book called Freedom, My Book of Firsts in 2016, covering her life since the release of her first book. She is now 40 years old. She has stated that she would not prevent her daughters from seeing Philip if they really wanted to, as much as she hates the idea. She said that she and her daughters have learned to laugh at the challenging life they get to experience together. We can't possibly comprehend how she felt throughout all of those years, or even how she feels now. It's nothing short of a miracle that she's doing well, and I think we definitely should commend her for that fact alone. Everyone, thank you again so much for watching. I was uh, blown away by the amount of views on the last video, like 50K, holy shit. I never imagined, you know, even like 100 people would want to watch uh, my content back when I started. So, thank you. And uh, if you want to see more lesser known cases, be sure to subscribe, that's what I do. If you have a suggestion for a case, feel free to uh, drop it in a comment, I'll probably see it. But if you want to really make sure I see it, uh, send it through Instagram or the Facebook page in the description. See you next time.